Uh, thank you very much for uh, turning out on a, an unseasonably uh, chilly uh, Nashville night, and I understand tomorrow it'll be even more challenging from the point of view of weather. I'm sorry I won't be here to share that with you, uh, but I'm going to New York where I doubt things will be much improved. Uh, but I am coming from Key West, uh, where the uh, 24th uh, Annual Literary Symposium has uh, just uh, un unfolded. Uh, and I only mention that because I got up at 6 this morning to fly to Tampa and from Tampa to Atlanta to here. And so my hearing is much diminished uh, <coughs> and my uh, throat is uh, somewhat raspy and I have taken some sort of pharmaceutical uh, 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 pill, silver bullet, and, <laughs> and uh, I'm uh, uh, a little bit woozy, but delighted to be here. Uh, and uh, it is true that uh, this is, in a sense, a homecoming for me. I, uh, when I was last uh, in Nashville, I had the great uh, uh, privilege of uh, giving the Robert Penn Warren uh, lecture at the Frist Center. I think that was in 2003, and then to back uh, back. Uh, real, the, uh, real back, I think, uh, 10 years ago, I was last uh, here again. Um, yes, <clears throat> this is uh, a counter-narrative, uh, Islam and the uh, making of the uh, first Europe. Um, I've been asked, and I was being asked uh, in the... Uh, uh, during the reception, uh, why on earth uh, uh, my name uh, is on a uh, uh, book jacket uh, with the title uh, God's Crucible, Islam and the Making of Europe, 570 to 1215. Um, and I suppose it's not self-evident that a historian of uh, the Harlem Renaissance and of the Dreyfus case and of uh, Du Bois, his life, uh, and of... Uh, the uh, uh, bicentennial history of the District of Columbia would find himself uh, writing uh, such a book. Uh, if you buy the book, you will find a very convincing, plausible explanation in uh, the introduction. Uh, but uh, to sum up what is said there, uh, many years ago in the early 1980s, I was writing a book on imperialism in the Horn of Africa. Uh, called The Race to Fashoda, European Imperialism and African Resistance. Um, and I lived in uh, the Sudan <clears throat> in order to have access to British military uh, archives housed then and I hope still uh, housed at the uh, old Gordon College, uh, then and now called the University of Khartoum. And I developed a number of friendships and uh, I uh, left and I wrote that book uh, <clears throat> but before it came out, uh, the uh, secular regime uh, uh, there in the Sudan was overthrown and uh, Sharia was imposed and the lives of the people I knew uh, changed uh, quite drastically, I imagined. The young co-eds who uh, once uh, uh, tra traversed the... Uh, 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 campus in uh, tight jeans and the faculty who uh, imbibed a good bit of, uh, of, uh, of bourbon and booze and beer, uh, all that uh, was a radical lifestyle change for them. And uh, then I thought, well, I wrote a book about uh, the uh, Muslim uh, Islamic fundamentalism and uh, what it did to the advance of the British Empire up the Nile in the 1890s when it stopped the world's greatest empire, uh, dead coal, for a decade. And uh, it uh, occurred to me that we were at the end of the 20th century uh, living again through experiences that were going to have similar uh, confrontations, the blowing up of the embassies in North and in, uh, in, uh, East Africa, uh, the Beirut uh, uh, barracks, uh, and uh, of course the first assault on the Twin Towers. And so I thought something like this is happening, is, is going to occur to the 20th century's uh, uh, great empire. Uh, and so I proposed writing just a meditation on, uh, and a short book it was to be, 
Uh, I, of course, could not anticipate that Osama bin Laden's timetable uh, was quite different from the one I imagined some Islamic fundamentalist would have. And so 9-11 uh, occurred just as I was uh, beginning to do the uh, field research for the book and was in Morocco on the morning of 9-11. But that's why this book uh, uh, was, was written. And now it does seem to be uh, somewhat uh, uh, peculiarly appropriate. When historians think about the present, it means uh, thinking about the past and the present. With respect to the long competitive cohabitation of Christianity and Islam, the problem of historical interpretation has become exceedingly problematic. So much so that the proposition that Europe and Islam have a shared history and a shared destiny runs straight against the grain of post 9-11 prejudices which seem to harden month by month. Conceptual dichotomies abound in which clashes are inevitable, in which the Muslim world is said to have gone wrong centuries ago, and the menace of something called Islamofascism uh, stalks the land. A handful of recent books offers the promise of sober reevaluation. Richard Bulliet's provocative, The Case for Islamo. Christian civilization, for example, or Michael Hamilton Morgan's excellent new book, uh, Lost History, The Enduring Legacy of Muslim Scientists, Thinkers, and Artists, or George uh, Saviala's stunning monograph, Islamic Science and the Making of the European Renaissance. The long collaboration of the Abrahamic religious uh, religions uh, in Iberia is vividly evoked in Rosa Menacol's The Ornament of the World and comprehensively discussed in the two-volume edition The Legacy of Muslim Spain, assembled by Salma Jayousi. These works barely make a dent, however, in a controlling narrative that insists upon the historic incompatibility of the Christian West and the Muslim East. I suggest that to begin at the beginning, at the moment when Islam arrives on the continent of Europe, enables us to appreciate how the use and abuse of history has transformed objective contingency into a creedal inevitability. The great medievalist Sir Charles Oman described Visigothic Iberia as having been exceptionally opaque even for the so-called Dark Ages. The rulers of Roman Hispania were a minuscule percentage of the total population of Iberia, at most some 400,000 Visigoths among no less than 5 million Hispano-Romans, Celts, Jews, Basques, and several other groups. Until the late 6th century, the Visigoths safeguarded the integrity of caste not only by a ban on intermarriage, but by holding fast to a heterodox interpretation of the Christian trinity to which most of the German tribes had originally subscribed during the fourth century. Ricared, one of the few distinguished Visigothic kings, finally decided to embrace the doctrine of the trinity as established by the Council of Nicaea in 325 Christian era. Religious conversion was a reasonable price to pay, he thought, for a truly national monarchy, and thus he formally embraced Roman Catholicism at the Third Council of Toledo in 589. Thereafter, Jews were to be persecuted with increasing savagery by succeeding Visigoth monarchs. As near as can be determined from al-Hakam's narrative of the conquest of al-Andalus, the battle for Iberia was fought by Muslims and Visigoths uh, on or before 28 Ramadan 92, July 19, 711, in and around the region the Arabs called Shaduna, today's Medina Sidonia. The rock of Gibraltar, Jebal Tariq, Tariq's mountain, bears the name of the Berber commander, Tariq Ibn Ziyad, who led 7,000 Berber horse and infantry from Ceuta to Algeciras. Visigothic Hispania imploded with bewildering speed. 
and the fiercely persecuted Jews of Sevilla, Cordoba, and Toledo assisted the Muslims in securing those cities. Tariq and his people had come to stay for almost 800 years. But to speak of this moment as the moment of confrontation between Islamic civilization and Christian Europe, however, would indulge historical anachronism. There were, as yet, no Europeans. The term itself, Europensis, awaited fabrication a hundred years in the future. Proselytizing was alien to Islam in Muslim Spain, what the conquerors called Al-Andalus, as elsewhere in the Ummah, or community of believers. Moreover, the tax benefits of slow-rate conversion always remained compelling to the conquerors. The transition from the status of Dimi, a protected person of the book who paid the hisya, the poll tax, to Mola, or more precisely, Mualad, a Muslim of Iberian stock and released from paying the hisya, began in the first years of the conquest and steadily accelerated. And from this policy flowed in good time the fabled convivencia, an ethos of storied tolerance and mutuality in which Muslims, Christians, and Jews would long enjoy, if not with the prodigious success too often romanticized ex post facto, civilized coexistence that might have served as a model for the continent. To be sure, it was not social equality that distinguished the convivencia, but tolerance secured by restrictions. Infidels were not allowed to erect new houses of worship, nor repair old ones, nor were Christians and Jews to hold public religious processions, pray too loudly, or proselytize. Sumptuary laws required the display of badges and that dima uh, clothing, protected people's clothing, be distinguishable from that worn by Arabs. The bearing of arms was forbidden. East of the Pyrenees lay the old Roman province of southwestern Gaul, what the Muslims called the Great Land. Several sorties into the Great Land occurred during the decade after the Muslim occupation of Al-Andalus. A major penetration was attempted in 732. Perhaps as many as 30,000 Arabs and Berbers swarmed over the landscape of Aquitaine. If you stand today on the plateau that slopes down from the forlorn little village of Mousset la Bataille, south of Poitiers, you see the Roman highway looking like a thin line drawn by a piece of chalk straight across a green slate. Charles the Bastard positioned his few thousand francs on the plateau in a formation parallel with the Roman road. A Catholic monk somewhere in Al-Andalus left a fitting description of the astonishing situation of that day. Quote, the men of the north stood as motionless as a wall, he wrote. They were like a belt of ice frozen together and not to be dissolved as they slew the Arabs with the sword. Quotes, Jihad met its match on the slopes of Musa la Bataille as wave after wave of Muslim horsemen caromed off the Franks' human berm. It was a great victory for what the Catholic monk called the Europenses. Charles the Bastards, apotheosis as the hammer, Martel, commenced from that day. From that same historical instant, the people who prevailed at Musse la Bataille soon obtained a new and prospectively potent identity. In calling the victors at Poitiers Europenses for the first time, the Catholic monk's neologism introduced a holistic concept that transcended, definitionally at least, the savage particularisms of the 8th century, a meta-category to replace the lost, lamented Civitas Romanum. Edward Gibbon, the arbitral 18th century English historian, called the outcome at Poitiers world historic. Ernst Levis, one of the masters of early 20th century historiography, exulted that Poitiers saved Europe from Asiatics and the Africans. 
the great German military historian Hans Delbruck, writing in the early 20th century, declared, there was no more important battle in the history of the world. Writing at the beginning of this century in Carnage and Culture, Landmark Battles and the Rise of Western Power, American historian Victor Davis Hanson was of the same opinion. What these and other Western historians omit, however, from the story, either from genuine ignorance or willful partisanship, is that far from bringing an end to Islamic incursions, Poitiers accelerated them. For the remainder of the decade after the slaughter at Musset la Bataille, Franks and Latins were pressed nearly to the breaking point by ever larger and strategically more venturesome Muslim attacks from Al-Andalus. Instead of being the definitive terminus, 732 represented a significant spike on the Islamic invasion graph. Later, when the loss of the great land was understood to be permanent, Muslim historians like Al Masudi in the Golden Prairies would pass over Poitiers with minimal commentary. But in doing so, unlike the enemy Franks who took all the credit for saving Europe, the Muslims would rightly blame their own internecine preoccupations as the real reason uh, for Christian Europe's survival. For the real explanation of the importance of Poitiers lay in the fact that the Muslim world changed dynasties in 750 after the Umayyad Caliphate perished in a river of blood, the caliphate that had uh, been founded in 660 uh, with some back and forth uh, by a family uh, whose name uh, was given to uh, the dynasty, the Umayyads, who will last for almost a century. Uh, so it lay in the fact that the Muslim world changed dynasties in 750. Ninety years of Umayyad history were annulled in the great Berber revolt, the revolts in the Maghreb, and in the politico-religious eruption in the Iranian East, lasting more than a decade after 740. But whether or not Poitiers had indeed assured the future civilization of the West, an occasional Western his, uh, um, scholar has asked a more philosophical question about Poitiers, one that eschews considerations of nationality and religion. Suppose the Amir al gafiqis men had prevailed that October in 732. Two mid-century French, French historians, Jean-Henri Roy and Jean Devios, enumerated the benefits that would have come from a Muslim triumph at Poitiers. Astronomy, trigonometry, Arabic numerals, the corpus of Greek philosophy. Quote, we, Europe, would have gained 267 years, according to their calculations. We might have been spared the wars of religion that soaked the 16th and 17th centuries in blood. So hypothesized they. Of one overarching consequence of Poitiers, there could be no doubt. The battle served the vaulting ambitions of Charles Martel's family, the Pippinids, as they were called, and imparted to the Frankish people a special identity and ascendancy, in great measure derived from both the victory and the victor's narrative. Franklin the greater part of modern France and Western Germany, Franklin, would be transformed, writes the Carolingian historian Pierre Richet, from an outpost of Mediterranean civilization to the center of a new Christian civilization. Of the several German tribes that might have propelled a regional kingdom into a continental powerhouse, Goths, Saxons, Alemanni, etc., it would be the Franks who achieved this singular feat. There was a time when few of the foundational outcomes that constitute European civilization as we know it were anything but inevitable. The French nation and the papacy were entities in utero 
as the Muslim dawn broke over the Iberian Peninsula. History can predict the past, however, and from that perspective, it is evident that the logic of Europe's creation as a coherent culture and polity inhered in the commencing coordination and collaboration of the bishopric of Rome and the regime of the French of the Catholic Franks. For three centuries, the soul of the Frankish people had been preserved through the unbroken line of Merovingians from Clovis the first, 476 to 511, through mostly unremarkable Childerics and Dagoberts. French historians have called them the do-nothing kings, yet nothing could be done without them. Charles Martel, like his father and grandfather, served these Merovingians as de facto ruler of the realm, palace mayors, prime ministers. But that Charles's son and heir, Pippin the Short, would ever himself rule in the name, in name as well as in reality, seemed at that time unlikely. Circumstantial evidence suggests that the tall, gangly Northumbrian holy man, beatified as St. Bonif bon <coughs> Boniface, solved Pippin's dilemma. Quote, was it right that he who holds the power does not rule? Boniface asked the Pope. Rome's anticipated answer set in motion a scheme of regime change sanctioned by the Pope. Regime change in return for defense of the Holy Father from the awful scourge of the Lombards, the last of the German invaders to, guard, uh, to carve out a kingdom in Italy. In 751, almost 10 years to the month after Charles the Hammer's demise, the last Merovingian king, Childeric III, was deposed. Boniface officiated at the coronation of the new king in the Abbey of Saint-Denis, Pippin the Short, mayor of the palace of Austrasia and Neustria, became King Pippin I in his 37th year, the first Carolingian royal. The precise terms of the bargain with the Bishop of Rome came shortly thereafter. The palace compound at Pontian near Metz vanished without a trace more than a thousand years ago. A curious fate for a place where preliminary decisions were taken that lay the foundations for the first nation state in Europe, the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome, the irrecoverable alienation of the Latin West from the Greek East, and the emergence of religious fanaticism and chronic reciprocated hostility of Islam and the Occident. The first pontiff to travel beyond Italy voluntarily, Stephen III and his coterie reached Pontian in late December 753 after braving wolves and alpine uh, hypothermia and at the most parlous moment facing the Holy See since the menace of Attila the Hun. The Lombard king, Eistuf, possessed of an insatiable real estate appetite was nearly at the gates of the eternal city. King Pippin's nine-year-old son, the future Charlemagne, led the Pope by his mount's bridle uh, to the palace. In an opening, in an imposing ceremony of incense, pageantry, and Latin staged in the Abbey of Saint-Denis, Pippin was anointed again with holy oil and again pronounced king by virtue of the authority reposed in the Pope by St. Peter. The Franks pledged to uphold the papal territorial claims in Italy above all others. To other claims of territorial rights, Stephen presented an answer to trump the competition, pulling one of history's most famous forgeries from his saddlebags, the donation of Constantine. As Stephen patiently explained to Pippin, Emperor Constantine I had deeded to the bishops of Rome imperial property of Italy and the rights thereunto as he departed for his new capital on the Bosporus. With the popes then riding in the baggage wagons, King Pippin entered Italy in late summer of 754 at the head of a formidable military expedition. The Lombards sued for peace 
withdrew from the Duchy of Rome and agreed to return the confiscated lands to the papacy. When Pippin's oldest son and heir came to the throne uh, to rescue, to the rescue of the Pope, a Pope named Adrian I, Stephen's successor, 20 years later, Charlemagne destroyed the Lombard kingdom, occupied most of Italy, minus the new papal states, and with Adrian's Easter morning blessings in St. Peter's, incorporated the conquered territory into an immense Frankish empire stretching from the Adriatic to the Pyrenees. Charlemagne assumed the the imposing title of Rex Francorum et Langobardorum, King of the Franks and the Lombards. Joseph Stalin is said to have asked how many divisions the Pope had. Popes Stephen and Adrian I could have claimed to have as many Carolingian divisions as were necessary. The alliance and codependency of the papacy and the Franks The foundations of primitive Europe resulted in large part from the fallout from Poitiers. The Belgian historian Henri Piren chose Mohammed and Charlemagne as the apt title of his influential book about the intersection of Islam and Christendom. In reality, the amended title, Mohammed Abdal Rahman and Charlemagne, could have described far better the political, religious, and cultural stakes of the 8th century, for it was the stalemated rivalry of two colossi, Abdal Rahman I from 756 to 788, and Charles the Great from 768 to 814, that greatly determined the long-term outcomes of Muslim, Christian, and Jewish cohabitation and competition on the European continent. As Charlemagne's immense military machine consolidated much of Europe east of the line of the Pyrenees, the inspired rule of Abd al-Rahman I, one of the last survivors of the obliterated Umayyad dynasty we discussed earlier, stabilized, rationalized, and secured al-Andalus for several centuries of Muslim dominion. The result was that two Europes, Muslim and Christian, met at the the Pyrenees in the last quarter of the eighth century in what would have been but for strategic confusion and happenstance, the great first clash of civilizations. To French scholars, Charlemagne's Spanish campaign of 778 remains a somewhat embarrassing sidebar to which little attention is paid except for the famous ambush of Roland at Roncevaux. But in reality, Charlemagne intended to add Al-Andalus with its Muslims forcibly converted and its subject Christians and Jews pledged to himself in a huge Carolingian empire stretching from the Adriatic to the Atlantic. Charlemagne headed for the Pyrenees, quote, at the head of all the forces that he could muster, says Einard, his faithful biographer of what was really Europe's first international military operation. The shock of Christian armies bent on occupying the cities galvanized the Andalusian political class. For the first time in history, part of the Dar al-Islam, the House of Islam, was under significant attack from the people of the Christian book. Had Charlemagne's invasion been successful, it would have accelerated the armed confrontation with Islam by four centuries. Instead, the army assembled from virtually every corner of the Frankish realm failed to conquer a single hostile Muslim city. It had leveled the walls of the Basques Pamplona, the only Christian city along the line of march. To minds of the Dark Ages and of later times, the ambition at the summit of the Western Pyrenees unfolded literally as related by the author of the greatest song of deeds or chanson de geste, the song of Roland. Whoever he was, the author Toroldus put into decasyllabic verse 
near the close of the 11th century, not long before the First Crusade, and at about the same time, probably, as the Bayou Tapestry was woven, a story that became first the national epic of France, and soon thereafter, one of the great constitutive myths of Christendom. Turoldus, who would have known the available Latin translation of the Iliad, serves up the biggest clash of civilizations since the Greeks and the Trojans, with Islam as the enemy. The convenient elimination from the saga of the Christian Basques and the substitution of the Saracens permits the transformation of a costly sneak attack on a mountain trail into a Manichaean standoff between two civilizations. This foundational document, written down three centuries after Roncesvall, was to be a superordinate factor in the European sense of self and of otherness, of what Europeans were and others were not. Though much of it was a fabrication of history, it possessed the higher truth of folk myth. We remember that the great saga unfolds as Charlemagne's grand coalition of Christian knights is 30 leagues march beyond the mountain and the Saracens spring their trap. To his alter ego, Count, Olivier, Count Oliver, who thrice appeals that Roland blow the oliphant, an ivory horn whose reverberations in the valley below would bring reinforcements, Roland grandly retorts that such would be an outrage. Oliver, the anti-Roland, protests his friend's perversity, saying through gritted teeth, la prudence est plus importante que la bravoure, prudence is more important than valor. Fighting to the last man, Roland and Oliver perish with the flower of Frankish chivalry. The heroic individualism prized by the Chanson de Geste was not a right possessed by the European everyman or every woman. Not all Franks were Rolands. Most were peasants, priests, merchants, and common folk, but all Rolands were Franks. And since the best of the Franks were Rolands, and stars, therefore, of a warrior class that was fast becoming a warrior caste, Franks, in general, imbibed and propagandized the virtues spilled at Roncevaux. In time, then, the Franks became Europe's archetypal sword bearers. In the erudite phrase of one literary scholar, the song of Roland serves as the inspiration for the gesta dei per Francos, works of God through the Franks. Urtext for the West, in a word. Nor is it reductionist to underscore that Turoldus's epic embedded the otherness of Islam deep in the memory banks of the West. During the next two centuries, the ninth and the tenth, Muslim and Christian Europe faced each other in a delicate, a delicate <clears throat> equipoise at the great Pyrenees divide. In the short run, history would be unkinder to Christian Europe. The Carolingian Empire's collapse and fragmentation after 843, the Viking infestations in the late 19th century, late 9th century, the Magyar incursions in the 10th. Meanwhile, Andalusia's golden age unfolded in the reign of the remarkable Amir and Caliph Abd al Rahman III, direct descendant of, of course, the first, whose reign is from 912. To 961. The new caliph's palace city, the Madinat al Zara, which rose on the slopes of the Sierra Cordoba, three miles northwest of the Andalusian capital, was an architectural hyperbole whose remains beggar Versailles, as in the caliph's time, its colonnaded great halls, geometric gardens, and cascading fountains awed generations of ambassadors and humbled subjects. Caliphal Cordoba, as befitted a world capital, dressed itself up spectacularly during Abd al-Rahman's golden reign. Cordoba's 70-odd libraries amaze modern scholars all much 
as almost as much as they stunned literate Christians of the late 10th century. There would be nothing at all comparable elsewhere in the West to the city's main library of 200,000 volumes of mostly paper manuscripts. Edward Gibbon delighted at the book worship of the citizens, a bibliophilia he disdainfully contrasted to the paucity of written works in the Christian West. The availability of paper made from bark, linen, and hemp, not the papyrus of pressed reeds of the Egyptians, would have an impact on Muslims, on Muslims similar to the printing press on Europeans 400 years later. Cordoba's narrow streets were lined by thousands of small shops and workshops where weavers produced brocades, silks, and woolens, craftsmen shaped crystal and tooled the famous Cordovan leather. There would be paved streets lighted by torch. An abundance of inns and hostelries would accommodate travelers on business, its 900 public baths serving citizens as attentive to hygiene as to cultivated relaxation over food and games. Rosrithra of Gandersheim, a Saxon nun of rare learning and extraordinary influence for her sex and time, would describe the Cordoba of Abd al-Rahman III as the brilliant ornament of the world, an epistolary effusion that became famous. In the mid-9th century, Abd al-Rahman II and Mohammed I, Abd al-Rahman III's predecessors, had lavished favors on men of learning, had amassed rare manuscripts in proud rivalry with Baghdad. Cordoba never surpassed Baghdad with its two million souls as the seat of Islamic scholarship, but it would eventually achieve a second-to-none prominence in its own right. The signature of Arabic philosophy, falsafa, was synthesis and commentary whose prototype came with the Persian-inflected writings of Yaqub ibn Ishaq al-Kindi during the middle of the ninth century. A star in the house of wisdom, the Bayt al-Hikmah of Baghdad, Al-Kindi professed to be able to harmonize Greek philosophy with the precepts of the Quran. His treatise on intellect won him renown as the first philosopher of Islam and respect or reproached, according to theological prejudice, as the original source of the Neoplatonic and Aristotelian ideas that flooded and perturbed the Christian West uh, some three centuries later. Rudimentary algebra would reach Cordoba from Baghdad sometime in the early 9th century when the first book to use the term al-Jabar crossed the Gibraltar Straits. Al-Khwarizmi's Kitab al-Jabar wa Muqabala, the book of compulsion and comparison. Its meaningful discovery on the far side of the Pyrenees had another three centuries to run. In Al-Andalus, Christians assimilated the new Muslim learning in the sciences and humanities with an almost untroubled alacrity, thereby creating a basis of knowledge which would provide the foundation for the Renaissance and Christendom certain to come. In the polarized 12th century, the flow of knowledge gave way, even so, to a virtual flood Muslim learning, having seeped into the Christian West for decades from Al-Andalus, commenced a torrential outflow. It was a process mimicking osmosis at first and later a conveyor belt. Hasdai ibn Shaprut's 10th century translation of the Materia Medica of Dioscorides more than doubled the medical and pharmacological corpus available in Europe. In truth, by the first quarter of the 12th century, philosophy and science fairly tumbled out of occupied Toledo into Christian Europe. Toledo, of course, as you recall, having been occupied by Ferdinand in uh, 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 1085. The seepage of early times had yielded to the writings of Ibn Hazim, historian, jurist, and Platonist, of al zarqiyal or Zarqalu, as in uh, the West, Toledan astronomer, whose Toledan table shaped the development of Latin astronomy and exploration. 
of Solomon ibn Gabirol, Sephardic philosopher and poet of Zaragoza, influential in the Latin West as the Avisi Braun. The impact of Gerbert of Iriac of Aurillac's mathematics textbook was far from widespread east of the Pyrenees, and I see that I need to say a word or two about uh, Gerbert. He was a um, uh, exceedingly brilliant uh, student of a cathedral school uh, who received uh, the equivalent of a stipend to study in uh, Muslim Spain, uh, in both uh, Barcelona and Sevilla, and finally in Cordoba. Uh, and there <clears throat> he mastered uh, the new arithmetic of the Arabic numbers, or the Hindu numbers, uh, with the zero, and uh, uh, composed a four-page thin book uh, uh, explaining uh, the uh, geometry and mathematics that was possible with the new numerals. And as he soon became Pope Sylvester II, uh, his uh, um, uh, 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 impact uh, on the West was considerably more than otherwise it would have been as his book initially was thought to be devil's work uh, and uh, worthy of suppression. A man of science and philosophy who became well known to literate Christians was a Persian who never traveled to Al-Andalus. His Latinized name was Avicenna, a child prodigy born in a remote corner of the Muslim empire at the end of the 10th Abu Ali ibn Sina had assimilated the entire contents of a sultan's library by age 18. Ibn Sina, the philosopher, caused the doctors of the church much worry about his synthesis of Platonic and Aristotelian pantheism. Ibn Sina, the physician, was eventually received almost with veneration, however. al Kanun, the canon, his magnum opus, was a summa of all Greco-Arabic medical knowledge, systematically described and logically explained. Its classification of contagious diseases and description of the progression of tuberculosis made Avicenna's canon the principal authority in the medical schools of Europe and Asia for centuries. The literate culture of poetry, reason, and science cradled at Baghdad and nurtured in Umayyad al-Andalus would be the retarded Latin West's academy. As the long experiment in al-Andalusian confessional, confessional tolerance from 900 to 1100 began to fade, Toledo experienced, even so, its remarkable Indian summer of prodigious interfaith collaboration. Welcomed by Castile's Alfonso VI and their activities encouraged by Archbishop Raimundo, Many of the finest Christian, Muslim, and Jewish intellects in Europe assembled there in order to interpret, debate, and translate. The Toledo conveyor belt delivered a volume of translated data that lifted the cultural level of the West significantly. Herman of Carinthia translated the astronomical tables of al Karizmi, as well as the Planisphere of Ptolemy. Gerard of Cremona produced a new translation of Aristotle's physics and Euclid's elements, Al-Kindi's De Lectu, he also translated, and some 70 more lost or poorly rendered works. The first solution of a quadratic equation published in Christendom based on the calculations of Abraham Bahia came from the indefatigable Plato of Tivoli, who translated a small library of Muslim astronomical and trigonometric data. Other missing books by Ptolemy became available, the Almagest, the Quadripartitum. Robert of Ketton, assisted by Hermann of Dalmatia and an unidentified Muslim, was commissioned by Peter the Venerable, head of the Cluniac Order, to produce a true Latin version of the Quran, which appeared, the better to document the heresy of Muhammad in 1143. For their part, literate Muslims in Baghdad and Al-Andalus had possessed Arabic translations of the Christian scriptures for more than two centuries. Another hundred years of such rarefied Judeo-Christian Muslim collaboration as that at Toledo would produce the entire corpus of the recovered ancient learning known today. 
The conveyor belt at Toledo transmitted most of what Paris, Cologne, Florence, and Rome knew of Aristotle and Plato, Euclid and Galen, the Hindu numbers and Arab astronomy. After the second decade of the 13th century, however, the lauded convivencia was chased into oblivion by Muslim and Christian holy warriors, respectively shouting, God is great, Allahu Akbar, and St. James the Moorslayer, Santiago Matamoros. By then, the exceptional civilization presided over by the Umayyad emirs and caliphs of Cordoba for 275 years was but a memory cherished by Spain's Moriscos, as they then became to be known, and reviled by Christians. For centuries thereafter, the main outlines of this story trace the rise of a reciprocally reassuring ignorance and of an addiction to war as the substitute to the complexities of coexistence. I end the book with a 16th chapter entitled Knowledge Transmitted, Rationalism Repudiated, uh, Ibn Rushd and Musa Ibn Maimun. And I do so because those two men, uh, Avereos and uh, Moses Maimonides, represent the tragic victims of the, of the militancy that uh, befalls Al-Andalus uh, after the fall of Toledo as the Almoravids and then the Almohads uh, come to support their co-religionists against the northern uh, Catholic Christians. Uh, <clears throat> and in that um, um, militancy uh, that sweeps over the land, uh, these men stand out as representatives of the best of the tradition of a convivencia, but they themselves become uh, 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 men out of, uh, uh, out of their times. Uh, one will die disgraced and indeed has been virtually erased from the Muslim uh, canon, Avareos or Ibn Rushd, uh, discovered in the 19th century by, uh, by Ernst Renan and of very late uh, uh, receiving uh, long uh, denied attention. And Moses Maimonides, who represented the best of, uh, of Arabic culture in many ways, in that he wrote all uh, but the Mishnah Torah in, uh, uh, in Arabic, uh, becomes, uh, abjures uh, the um, Arabic experience that he has had uh, and uh, 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 leaves uh, Al Andalus. And so I'll stop on that note. <laughs> I hope there are questions. Uh, it's very hard to hear you, sir. Uh, not really. Um, can you really shout? <laughs> well, someone uh, <laughs> relate that because he's at the very back of the auditorium. And although I think the acoustics are good going this way, they are not so good. What is what? What advice would you give to the Secretary of State in order to help bring about a peace in the world based on your, your insight? Oh, how, how appropriate. Yeah, a, a question. Uh -huh. um, well, um, this is not a Secretary of State one readily gives advice to on the basis of her, her past uh, uh, performance and personality, although uh, I, I noted that the Times uh, uh, reports that she has stated that uh, she's, uh, the State Department is going to be uh, <coughs> uh, shaken up and, uh, and, uh, and, and very uh, uh, engaged, which only seems logical. Uh, uh, if, if there's a point to a, a book like this, it's that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, <coughs> the problems that are perceived to be matters of, uh, of culture um, uh, and, and therefore religion 
more often than not, really have little to do uh, with culture or religion, uh, but have to do with politics and economics, uh, geopolitics. Um, and if uh, that's a reasonable um, analysis, then I would think uh, one way of getting a handle on uh, the great tensions that uh, 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 um, uh, assail us uh, would be to look at uh, what uh, people don't like about what we do to them. Uh, and that would have something to do with how long we plan to stay in parts of the world where we were not invited. Uh, Afghanistan, say. Uh, so I think that would be the kind of advice that one might give the Secretary of State and indeed even, uh, even the uh, 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 President-elect. Uh, a, 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 tall and uh, a tall and obvious question. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, um, if one ventured uh, an, a, um, an informed response, I suppose it would go like this, that <clears throat> there are th three uh, pivotal moments in this relationship between the... Uh, between Europe and, uh, and the UMA. Um, and one is the first uh, siege of Vienna in the early uh, 16th century. And the other is the second siege of Vienna uh, in the late 17th century. And then I think uh, the third pivotal moment might be the year 1883. Um, now that sounds pretty reductionist, but in, in each case, things are happening uh, that astonish both sides. That is to say, the, second, the first siege of Vienna should have succeeded, and had it succeeded, uh, what didn't happen uh, at uh, the Battle of Poitiers uh, would have happened. That is, the incorporation of much of, of, of Europe, certainly all of Slavic Europe, but much of, uh, uh, much of Eastern Europe in uh, the uh, Muslim ecumen. Um, well, had that happened, uh, we'd have a very different kind of history, and so the question would have to be posed uh, differently. The second siege of Vienna uh, is uh, fairly close, but at that point, it's quite clear that certain things have happened uh, in the West that give the West, from the point of view of uh, uh, military uh, presence, uh, certain advantages. Um, and, uh, but it is not clear to uh, the Muslims uh, what those advantages are. Uh, and so there is a period after the Second Siege of Vienna uh, and after the Battle of Lepanto and some other things that we all remember having to uh, do uh, SAT uh, uh, responses uh, about. Uh, but there is, unlike uh, what uh, Bernard Lewis famously said, but he said the problem is that all sorts of things were happening in the West, and the Arab, the, the Muslim world never paid any attention, didn't care, went off on its own track. And that couldn't be more fallacious. In fact, uh, uh, the, uh, certainly the, the Ottomans <clears throat> and soon the uh, Egyptians tried their best to understand why the balance seemed to be tipping, and uh, they began incorporating uh, uh, the military science of the West uh, and uh, establishing uh, armies on the uh, Prussian model, uh, but um, <clears throat> even against the Russians, didn't, didn't, didn't work out. So then they began to say, well, uh, we need indeed the whole uh, cultural infrastructure 
that will transform the society. It's not good enough to have uh, new, new weaponry and uh, new uh, means of, uh, uh, of, of, of marching about and that sort of thing. And indeed, they began to do so. Uh, but it troubled uh, terribly uh, conservative forces within their own uh, societies. Nonetheless, they began to uh, mimic, as the Japanese uh, were to do, uh, the technology, uh, the science of, of the West. Um, and in the 19th century, indeed, uh, there is a sustained modernization going on. It's a complicated story. However, to <clears throat> mimic the West, uh, to acquire its technology, acquire its learning, uh, required also uh, deficit financing to do that. And all these polities borrow deeply from London and Paris uh, and, uh, and Frankfurt. Uh, and so that's why 1830, 1883 is the other uh, 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 date. Because by that time, the indebtedness of this world to uh, Western uh, 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 finance capital is enormous. And it has predictable consequences. That to secure the debts, the um, uh, the um, governments of, uh, of, of, uh, of Europe uh, begin to protect uh, those investments. And it begins first with uh, the seizure of the customs houses in Egypt and uh, elsewhere. And then uh, when that doesn't work, uh, as the um, uh, de debtors attempt to finance this debt and to uh, meet their obligations, they screw their people terribly, and that produces an irredentism. And so the modernizers are caught in two ways. One, they're trying to modernize by borrowing, and they have to pay those debts. To do that, they have to squeeze their own people, as the European bankers say, look, you're kind of falling behind the whole story. And so <clears throat> at that point, we get uh, the definitive uh, cr uh, crossing of the line with the 1883 invasion of Egypt. And from that point on, boots are on the ground in uh, the Middle East, and they will remain there in one form or another. And the, uh, a, a kind of pas de deux will then ensue of some modernizers saying, we've got to learn to live with them, and some saying, no, we've got to get rid of them. And uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, the, the, the antithesis uh, uh, that is so familiar today uh, uh, is, uh, is, is established then. Uh, finally, uh, your problem is one of demographics. Um, people are uh, moving where, uh, uh, until the EU slows down, uh, there were uh, job opportunities. Uh, and part of that comes from the fact that uh, the regimes that uh, uh, preside over them um, uh, use uh, immigration as a safety valve, um, as, say, the Mexican government has for so long uh, with uh, immigration to the United States. Um, uh, and uh, that, at first, is satisfactory to everybody. The Turks come, the Maghrebians come, they do the dirty work, they help build things, they fill the service economy, and then they don't go home, and so then we have complaints about the uh, taxpayer burdens, and then these people uh, become politicized as they are in the society but not of it, and so imams and uh, um, radical uh, uh, voices um, uh, uh, garner their attention. So that's part of what I would say. <laughs> yes? If you could just make it a little louder. 
find ourselves in the 21st century almost dealing with the same class of civilization. So I guess my question is, how do we, as a, as a global community, move beyond you know, and, and sort of move towards a more pluralistic um, idea of, of you know, something that is, as you mentioned in the first question that you answered, that is political and economic problems. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, gosh, that's, um, that, that's the challenge. Uh, well, you know, one of two things I, I guess might happen. Uh, these uh, regimes in the Middle East uh, have uh, so ill-served their uh, populations uh, that it's a, a matter of time before uh, they um, uh, are, are changed. Um, one can imagine things uh, uh, in, in Egypt, say, uh, that uh, are, are forthcoming. <clears throat> the, the street becomes angrier and angrier and angrier, uh, even though uh, the street has uh, been sort of um, given an opiate uh, of madrasas by these regimes who won't spend money for public education. I mean, it's just disgraceful. Uh, no money is spent in this part of the world on public education. So therefore, by default, the madrasas uh, have, have, that, uh, have that task and, uh, and, and succeed deplorably well. <clears throat> so uh, finally, though, uh, the, the madrasa street, it seems to me, will, um, will be very, very difficult to contain. The demographics are that in each and every one of these countries, uh, the uh, number of people under uh, uh, 20 is between 50 and 60 percent. Underemployment is off the charts. Uh, <clears throat> so um, the, the, it's a very volatile situation. Now, you could see another response, and that is governments with the uh, pro prodded by, say, the United States and the EU uh, powers. Uh, 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 forcing these regimes to spend more on uh, educational uh, infrastructure. Uh, one could imagine that. One could really imagine that uh, the five billion that goes to Egypt uh, could, uh, part of it could uh, uh, be targeted for uh, public education. Uh, and if that happened, uh, then uh, the um, uh, uh, the, the possibility of um, uh, an accommodation with modernity would uh, be uh, much, uh, much greater. But I think uh, it's, uh, it's uh, probably not going to happen that way. I, I rather imagine that except for the Emirates, uh, Abu Dhabi and Doha and Qatar and those places, uh, that we're headed for a situation of great instability uh, in which um, uh, the one power that seems to have a, um, a geopolitical uh, game plan that it can make work, Iran, uh, will determine uh, uh, how things shape up. And that's uh, sort of an unhappy uh, consequence, but uh, it may not be uh, and it may be it may be unavoidable. So the the kind of pluralism that we'd like to see uh, is is a long way down the down the pike, uh, and uh, um, it'll take a, a good bit of uh, of uh, of uh, coordinated uh, politicking on the part of the EU uh, to uh, uh, to be responsive to it in in. A, uh, ways that are credible and effective. Yes? Are you saying fiction? 
it's, uh, it's something about fiction. Friction. 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 Something about friction. Yeah. yeah. Ah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't been to uh, Spain since the economic downturn, uh, and so I really don't know what's going on. But before that, uh, no. Spain, really, things were rather hopeful, I think, in, in Spain. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Zapatero government seemed to... Uh, understand that immigration meant uh, jobs and uh, and uh, integration, and more than that, it meant the uh, the dignity of uh, of honoring the culture of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, Muslim culture. The whole debate about whether uh, the the great mosque of Cordoba should have Muslim services on on Friday uh, that was a very bold uh, and doable proposal. It, uh, it it raised the hackles of the church. But uh, without, uh, it, it could uh, later have, have, uh, have, have succeeded. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, it, it may, in, in fact, be the case that there will be uh, less friction also uh, because if Europe slows down, uh, people uh, do go home, as we see in this country where immigration is way, way uh, towards the bottom of anybody's concerns in Washington uh, because people aren't going to be here very shortly. Uh, and some of that is happening uh, in the EU. Unfortunately, it's not for the Germans happening. Uh, the Turks are not going anywhere. Uh, and indeed, they are growing in great numbers. And the Germans face uh, a, a great problem of, of two Germanys coming. Uh, the French are actually doing better. Uh, um, the, the British um, may um, not have such difficulties because the Pakistani population is insular, uh, it's uh, prosperous, uh, and uh, it, it can keep doing what it wants to do uh, so long as, um, it, you know, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury says, well, we could mix up Sharia with common law and that sort of thing. Um, so... Uh, it's a, we're at a point now where we really don't know because of the meltdown of the, of the economy uh, what, what we face um, in terms of uh, friction. Though I wouldn't be surprised if the immigration problem uh, really does uh, uh, abate uh, because people will go home. The economic situation in? Yeah. Well, I think maybe, thank you very much.